Wisdom is defined as the ability to act and make decisions with regard to one's experience and knowledge. Like courage and power, it is a trait that you develop over the course of your life. Progressing through a Zelda game allows you to reflect on the development of all three of these traits. Mandatory or optional blockades like these can prove your endurance and expand your understanding of the game, and it all starts with you summoning the courage to take the next step. Over the course of the game, ordeals like these eventually make you more powerful, as daunting enemies become just another minion to cut down. Finally, you reach your apotheosis as you scale Ganon's tower and defeat him. But courage and power both feed into the development of wisdom. These experiences will help inform your decisions later down the line, leaving you with a sense of maturity as the adventure comes to an end. Everything contributes to the development of your own wisdom. And while you can apply logical wisdom to the navigation of life's many hurdles, emotional wisdom is just as important. It's crucial to stay in tune with what you know and what you feel, because certain events will attempt to throw these two things out of balance. E3 2010 The first E3 I was able to keep up with as it happened. Nintendo reveals The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, the first Zelda game to be built specifically for the Wii. Twilight Princess gave us glimpses into what would be possible with the Wii's motion controls thanks to its pointer-based aiming and fishing controls, but swinging the Wii Remote and Nunchuck to fight enemies would merely emulate what were once button commands, leaving the implementation of motion inputs feeling gimmicky in hindsight. Skyward Sword ended up being Nintendo's swan song for the Wii. It would attempt to showcase how a Zelda game could flourish with the Wii's unique control scheme, and while its involved combat, orchestral soundtrack, and beautiful Impressionist-era art style excited me, the circumstances surrounding its development weren't as glamorous. First of all, the Wii itself was in a strange position by the time Skyward Sword was revealed. Nintendo's Blue Ocean strategy was working a little too well for them. The console sold astoundingly well for the first few years of its life, primarily thanks to the novelty of its control scheme. The nature of the Wii meant that it would be able to appeal to those who wouldn't normally play video games. Satoru Iwata aimed to do this from the very beginning, and in the end, he accomplished his goal. With that said, the Wii's casual focus drove Nintendo's core gaming market away, and sales waned as the motion control fad began to die out. The Wii Remote had its inherent flaws when it came to accuracy and motion sensing capabilities, with the first few years of Wii Remote functionality bringing us a few revolutionary games, some pretty neat games, some gimmicky games, and some unresponsive and just plain bad ones. Nintendo attempted to make amends with the Wii Motion Plus in 2009, but these substantial improvements to the Wii Remote seemed to come too late for it to matter. Only seven games ended up requiring the Wii Motion Plus, and for an accessory that essentially made the Wii Remote what it should have been in the first place, that's pitiful. Don't misunderstand me, there are some awesome motion-based games on the Wii, but with Sony and Microsoft launching the PlayStation Move and Kinect respectively, motion gaming no longer felt like a novel concept by the time Skyward Sword was being promoted, especially when you consider the growing pains that the medium faced. Of course, the story of the Wii is bigger than Skyward Sword itself, but it's important to know the context in which the game was developed. Although the Wii's best games will always be fondly remembered, the system and its once enticing control scheme was irrelevant in the face of the game industry at large by the early 2010s. Skyward Sword could either be a long overdue realization of what the Wii was capable of that perfectly complemented the design of Zelda, or yet another ill-fated attempt at pushing a dying fad in the interactive medium. After premiering the first trailer of the game at E3 2010, Shigeru Miyamoto and Bill Trinan demoed the game on stage. For those of you that don't remember this presentation, it was... Um, Looks like we're having a little interference here. Somebody out there using wireless? Anybody? In hindsight, there was probably some truth to that joke, but the choppy motion controls on display throughout this entire segment were... a little worrying, let's just say. I still get anxiety watching this, even after a decade. It would have been devastating for a mainline Zelda game to flop because of the controls, and it certainly didn't help improve people's perception of motion controls in general. After the show was over, I pushed the game to the back of my mind. I was still a kid at that point with a limited critical perspective on things. It also helped that Super Mario Galaxy 2 came out a couple of months later and absolutely floored me, and I had Flipnote Hey Tenna to keep me entertained. Simpler times. If only I didn't take them for granted. Hey man, what you doing? Dark, what's up? What's delay? Until when? November! No! 
Originally scheduled for release in March 2011, the game was delayed to November. The trailers they released in the meantime made the game look more exciting, but so many other things began to overshadow it. Nintendo revealed the Wii U that year, and the console took priority at E3. Nintendo also showcased a Zelda tech demo that immediately made an impression on people, far more than the aging look of the Wii's graphics. But a shift in focus away from Skyward Sword wasn't the only problem. Another high fantasy game was due for release around the same time as Skyward Sword. You might have heard of it. But even disregarding that, from all corners of the industry, Nintendo was surrounded by immense creativity and innovation in game design. And for the first time, Zelda wasn't leading that charge. As skepticism mounted, was Skyward Sword truly going to be as legendary as we'd come to expect from Zelda? In April of that year, I was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Of course, I ended up beating the disease. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be watching this video. But I associate most of my memories of that year with a hospital bed. As Skyward Sword's release date approached, I recall experiencing severe side effects to a type of chemotherapy I was on, forcing me to stay stuck in the hospital when the game came out. Thankfully, my mom was able to wheel in the game on one of those mobile TV carts, and in spite of my condition, I was finally able to play the game. Normally, I don't like talking about my illness, but like the circumstances in which Skyward Sword was developed, I think it's important to know the circumstances in which I first played it. Knowing them will make it a little easier to understand where I'm coming from when I say that I hated Skyward Sword on my initial playthrough. As I was trying to play the game while bedridden, the forced motion controls felt intrusive to me at every turn. It wasn't a matter of unreliability, it was the idea of them that I hated. As I attempted to adapt to them, I was also deeply disappointed by the game's linear structure. At a time in my life where I needed my favorite video game series more than anything, it was genuinely heartbreaking to have not enjoyed Skyward Sword back then. Over the next several years, I grew a lot as a person. I became stronger and wiser from my experiences with illness, grief, anxiety, and love, among other things. At some point, I was talking to a close friend of mine about Zelda, and we got on the topic of Skyward Sword. He was stunned by my strong negative feelings toward the game, even after I explained my circumstances to him. I still remember what he said to me. I understand you were suffering back then, but you need to play it again. It's not what you think it is. I eventually made him a promise. If my recently established YouTube channel were to reach a thousand subscribers, I would make a video on Skyward Sword. I would articulate everything that I had felt when I first played the game in a professional manner, and we would finally achieve some form of closure on that argument. It has been quite a while since I passed that milestone, and truthfully I did attempt to make that video back then. I was embarrassed that my initial thoughts on the game seemed to not be holding up any longer, and that bothered me because honestly I was pretty insecure at the time, so I put the video on hold. Over the next few years, I attended college and eventually grew into the person that I am today. I still have a lot to learn, but I feel like I'm much calmer and more rational than I used to be. I decided to revisit Skyward Sword out of a random spark of curiosity. I played through the entire game, and I really, really liked it. Sure, it certainly had glaring issues, but its mechanical ideas, level design, and overarching narrative deeply resonated with me. A combination of factors contributed to this. Obviously, I was no longer physically ill, but I had also matured a lot emotionally since the game was released. I was able to see the game for what it was. Finally, after nearly a decade, Skyward Sword had won me over. The love I have for Skyward Sword went through many trials and tribulations, from my initial apprehension, to admiration, to an internal conflict, and finally, a deep sense of respect. That being said, I am also now sure of the validity of my critiques, and I believe the game inspired wisdom in the Zelda team to steer the future of the series in a new direction. It was a tumultuous journey, and I want to share it with you all. Perhaps you too will discover if it wasn't what you once thought it was. I'm Liam Triforce, and this is a video about The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. Ocarina of Time's interpretation of Hyrule set the standard for what was possible in a 3D Zelda overworld. You'd visit and revisit multiple areas over the course of your adventure, but each revisit meant a new objective, 
Areas like Goron City, Lake Hylia, Zora's Domain, and Kakariko Village were all merely blank slates for events to transpire. New events like a frozen waterfall and the mystery of the bottom of the well were enough to transform already familiar areas. All the while, they were also being brought to life through side quests and hidden collectibles that had you view the world around you in a new light with each new dungeon item. And because these areas were all connected through Hyrule Field and other shortcuts like the Ravine and Gerudo Valley sweeping you into Lake Hylia, the world of Hyrule felt seamless. To this day, I think Ocarina of Time's Overworld is still one of the best in the Zelda series. Majora's Mask built on its foundation with the densely packed world of Termina, and its plethora of impactful side quests driven by its three-day time limit made the world all the more meaningful. Wind Waker drowned out the interconnected overworlds of the past in favor of the Great Sea, which had 49 different squares to explore, each hosting a unique island. It was a far different approach, but the distinctness of most areas that you discover just by sailing out into the unknown and the way the game evoked such wonder in doing so made it feel like a welcome interpretation of a Zelda overworld. Twilight Princess was where things got complicated. It was a much more linear game, but it was able to craft a specific kind of adventure because of its linearity. Its segmented areas like the Sacred Grove, the Gerudo Desert, and especially Snowhead thrived thanks to the game's focus. With that said, other areas of the game were designed to be interconnected and revisited for items and side quests like a more traditional Zelda game. And when you consider the way you progress through Twilight Princess, it's no wonder why some people weren't the biggest fans. However, I felt that those segmented areas were where Twilight Princess was able to shine brightest. And they weren't actually new to the Zelda series. The Gerudo Fortress, the Pirate Fortress, Ikana Castle, the Bottom of the Well, these were self-contained mini-dungeons that offered both linear and non-linear methods of progression. In the Gerudo Fortress, you'd be saving the Carpenters. In the Pirate Fortress, you'd be collecting the Zora Eggs. In those areas, you can approach things from many different angles and complete your objective in any order. And their approaches to both atmosphere and game design were stellar. Ikana Castle is also a testament to that, and although it was more linear than the other areas, figuring out how to enter the castle meant exploring the entire area first for a solution. Most of these areas held the puzzle box design that you'd see in a dungeon without being bound to the rules of dungeon progression, which made them all the more engaging and memorable. If a Zelda game's overworld, or perhaps even overworlds, were to feature several self-contained areas like those, the sky's the limit for what they could accomplish. And that's what they went for with Skyward Sword. Skyward Sword's level design is comparable to the shift from the sandbox approach in Super Mario 64 and Sunshine, to the self-contained missions in the levels of Super Mario Galaxy. This focus allowed for a more cohesive and linear introduction and progression in its concepts. That being said, there were miniature sandboxes in that game that required the player to explore for a path to the star, like Beach Bowl Galaxy for example. For the most part, this is accurate to how Skyward Sword is designed. Skyward Sword has you visiting three regions, Faron, Elden, and Leneru and each of these regions are completely disconnected from one another and the sky above. Becoming intimately familiar with your surroundings isn't a matter of venturing out into the unknown, it occurs as a result of the quests they have you partake in, and by following the paths the designers have created. Each region will have you run into a quest that you must complete before proceeding into the dungeon. Faron Woods has you searching for the missing Kikwis, while Elden Volcano and Leneru Desert have you searching for the pieces of their respective dungeon keys, among other things. Initially, the linearity of the world layouts bothered me, but with my current perspectives on the Zelda series, I began to see their merits. Each region is so good at fleshing out its ideas straight through to the dungeons they feature, there is a steady increase in difficulty across all three regions, and the ideas themselves are a lot of fun to play with. To begin, we'll first discuss Faron Woods. The area is designed as a giant roundabout that circles around a giant tree in the center, and paths diverge and connect outward in every direction, eventually looping back around to the center. You can douse for the Elder in order to get a general idea of where he is, but it's up to you to figure out how to reach him. Even so, you can look for the Kikwis before even having spoken to him, so you have a great deal of freedom in approaching the level. You can choose to fight the wandering enemies as they come by, or you can run past them and stick to the main battles to save the Kikwis. You can collect materials, there are tightropes to cross, environmental puzzles to solve, and your tenacity can lead you to a piece of heart. Some Kikwis are trapped amid a group of Bokoblins, while others are hidden in grass or along secret paths. They also gradually elevate the danger surrounding level mechanics, beyond simply increasing the amount of Bokoblins in an encounter. Take these tightropes, for example. 
First you walk over them with no present danger other than falling to the ground underneath and losing some progress. Then they lay mines across one, and finally they have you cross a tightrope over a pit with mines waiting for you and an enemy on the other side. As tricky as this seems, it also teaches you that you can jostle the tightrope to shake enemies off and clear the path of mines. Also when exploring far on woods, you'll be able to come across some curled up vines that you can't interact with, but when you save all of the Kikwis and witness the Slingshots application, new paths open up to you. It's a great first area. Then comes the Skyview Temple. While the woods that preceded this dungeon did require some observance of your surroundings, the impact of this was softened by the existence of dowsing because you'd have a general idea of where each Kikwi was at all times. Skyview Temple and all dungeons to follow take your dowsing away from you and ask you to figure things out on your own. The first hub of the Skyview Temple focuses on raising the water level so that you can reach the locked door, and the two gemstones that reveal the path to doing this are just barely telegraphed by a few weeds and a stray rupee which forces players to get their hands dirty in looking for solutions based on the clues they've received. There are also vines to unravel, unique applications of the sword to learn, and by the time you reach the second hub, an entirely new item to use in order to investigate your surroundings more thoroughly. The Skyview Temple is an effective introduction to dungeon concepts. It successfully builds on the ideas presented in Far On Woods, and its new ideas are essential in laying the groundwork for players to solve puzzles in Skyward Sword. There are specifics introduced here like the fight with Girahim that I'll discuss later on, but I feel Skyview Temple, albeit weak in comparison to previous first Zelda dungeons, is pretty cool. Far On Woods and Skyview Temple together serve as an introduction to the general flow of Skyward Sword, and they are but a small sampling of what the game does with this established structure. The next region you visit is Elden Volcano. The terrain here is far more dangerous thanks to the abundance of lava, and its level design revolves around navigating spiraling, interconnected paths so that you can eventually make your way up to the base of the volcano to the Earth Temple. Certain principles established in Far On Woods make a return, and this time they make sure to flesh out the uses for bombs. Throwing bombs in a 3D space has always been slightly awkward without locking onto an enemy, as you usually have to estimate where your bomb will go. Thankfully, Skyward Sword conveys exactly where your bomb will go no matter if you overhand it or underhand it. This is especially made apparent when you try throwing bombs into the shells of these seal-like monsters. The bomb's entire arc is telegraphed perfectly, allowing you to line up your throw. The applications of bombs, however, are where Elden Volcano shines most. At first you might be simply blowing up walls or rolling bombs across bridges, but things get complicated when they introduce steep hills. You can't carry bombs up or down these hills, as you have to sprint in order to traverse them. As such, your exploration for the key pieces will test you on your knowledge of bombs. You can collect these pieces in any order, and they all communicate something different about the way bombs work. This piece here requires you to roll a bomb down the hill and into the watchtower. This introduces you to the fuse timing of bombs, and the speed in which they travel downhill. You are then further tested on this with this piece hidden behind rubble in an alcove. You need to adjust your bomb throw and time it in accordance with the fuse so that it explodes right next to the rubble. This concept is also revisited in the region's dungeon, the Earth Temple, as you need to bomb open a hole on a slope, and the correct place to throw the bomb is conveyed through a dirt patch. This all culminates with you sliding down to a separate part of the base of the volcano and facing this puzzle right here. You have to somehow roll this bomb over the hill and close enough to the wall in order to nab the piece, but you'll soon realize that no matter where you throw it, the bomb won't make it. Eventually you'll come to the realization that you have to throw the bomb, run across, and then place it next to the wall. And once again, if you can't figure out how to nab one piece, you can always look for another and learn something else in the meantime. The Earth Temple is an extension of the volcano, just as Skyview was an extension of Far On Woods. But the central puzzle of figuring out how to navigate this giant ball around the hub throws a curveball at your developed skill set. On top of that, the key to actually moving this ball through the debris harkens back to those sneaky crystals and secret spots in Skyview Temple and Far On Woods. There's a very faint crack in the wall near those pillars that I didn't notice for a while, but it becomes easier to spot as the lava levels rise and lower slowly. Once you blast it open, the path becomes clear. Faron and Elden are both strong regions, and I appreciate the way their ideas seamlessly progress into their dungeons. The next region, however, is by far my favorite. It combines the knowledge of your items and the attentiveness taught in Faron and Elden for the Lanayru Desert. It begins with you approaching an abandoned mine. You push a minecart into a pit, and you're able to cross over to the other side. This plants the seed for one of many ideas that will show up throughout the region. As you wander further in, 
you'll spot an area littered with ancient technology and a giant stone in the center. This is a time shift stone, and upon activating it, the surrounding area will spring to life with color. Anything within the immediate vicinity of that crystal is taking place in the past, and that becomes the central mechanic of not just this area, but all of Lanayru. Not only is its visual dichotomy striking, but its ideas are some of the most inventive and fun to play with in the game. At first, the central idea is to find ways to power the minecarts so that you can travel to the next area, but then it expands far beyond this as a sprawling desert comes into view. From here, there are so many creative uses for the time shift stones. Throwing a bomb into a cage to activate a stone leads you to fighting enemies in the past and saving the ancient robot. I always loved the fact that you could knock the Bokoblins into the present and have them immediately turn to fossilized remains. This robot leads to an upgrade for your beetle that allows you to carry things mid-flight, which leads to the revelation of how to create platforms across the quicksand, a mechanic previously introduced through this tunnel. The quicksand also conveys the importance of managing your stamina. You probably already know this, regardless of whether or not you've played the game, but holding A in this game will make you sprint. As you sprint, your stamina gauge slowly depletes. Not only does this mechanic do away with the goofy rolling of the past, but it also has many level design applications throughout Skyward Sword. Running up walls, climbing vines and ladders, shimmying across ledges, running up steep inclines, even spin attacks drain some of your stamina. It is always there and it is always an active player in the design of Skyward Sword. The quicksand proves to be the greatest test of stamina management thus far, however, as it slows you down considerably and running out of stamina means, well, you get it. I feel the stamina meter makes the simple act of movement in Skyward Sword a constant puzzle, which feeds into the rest of the game's design beautifully. That being said, I understand where people are coming from when they say they don't enjoy managing it. I feel as though there needs to be a constant stream of new environmental hazards for it to remain interesting, but at the same time, the nature of a Zelda game means that isn't always possible. You're going to be using the stamina meter to run through areas you've already visited and hazards you've already cleared. The stamina meter is a contentious mechanic, but thankfully the game has ways for you to acclimate yourself to it, beyond the teaching tools. We'll talk about a couple of those ways in due time. Your journey through the desert will take you to the Temple of Time, and just outside is a maze of minecarts, time shift stones, enemies, and more. It's a joy to figure out how to traverse these chasms. There's the peninsula in the middle of the chasm, it holds the bridge that connects the entrance to the Temple of Time, a time shift stone that is activated by dropping a bomb into the top, and a crystal that opens the gate to the temple. While the puzzle itself isn't terribly challenging to figure out thanks to the progression and level concepts thus far, the payoff is seeing what this giant rock used to look like. A massive tree comes to life and immediately brings color to such a drab area. I think that's what I love most about Lanayru. As I'm figuring out how the past can affect the present, a washed out sandy wasteland becomes a lush and vibrant mining area, and the music changes to reflect this too. There's so much fun to be had puzzle solving in Zelda when you have a visual payoff in addition to progress being made. But the Temple of Time isn't the end for Lanayru Desert's great ideas. After navigating the hidden paths beneath the quicksand, you'll discover that you need to power three generator nodes in order to enter the Lanayru mining facility. The puzzles that follow are absolutely brilliant and a testament to Skyward Sword's smooth introduction of mechanics and incredibly cohesive progression and difficulty. While one of the generators can be found simply by crossing a secret quicksand path over to a hidden time shift stone, activating the other two generators is much more involved. Upon finding the rooms in which they are hidden, you'll spot nothing but a sea of quicksand and maybe a rolling ampelus or two. Strike the time shift stone, however, and the sand will disappear with the ampelus transforming into an electric ball. Your goal is to transport this ampelus to the generator and roll it in, all the while not getting electrocuted or hit by nearby bokoblins. In one of these generator rooms, there is a massive sea of sand traveling toward the north end of the room, but hitting the time shift stone reveals the contents underneath to be a giant bottomless pit. The ampelus cannot cross to the other side like this, not even if you drop a block down from the northwestern side of the room. This room genuinely stumped me for a long time, but figuring out the solution was awesome. First you ride the ampelus shell over to the other side of the room. This was first taught on the way over to the Temple of Time. Then you use the beetle to activate the time shift stone. After that, you fly the beetle over to an ampelus, grab it, and bring it over to the north side of the room. Of course, any puzzle seems simple in hindsight, but putting the numerous pieces together is where the difficulty lies. Like Elden Volcano's final set of puzzles, this feels like the perfect culmination of everything that Lanayru Desert conveys. 
You assess the way time affects an area, and you use the beetle to grab things out of your reach in order to conquer the Sea of Sand. And of course, this continues to escalate in Lanayru's dungeon, the mining facility. I still remember how I felt when I saw this place spring to life for the first time. This general feeling of lifelessness was immediately drowned out by eye-popping color and an abundance of technological hazards. The ways in which you navigate and interact with rooms can change entirely with the activation of a time shift stone. The way the music shifts to accompany this aesthetical overhaul, and along with the puzzles involving the stones and carts that create walkways for you, there are also puzzles involving platforms that need to be moved manually with the gust bellows. This item has two unique applications in the past and present. The past has you clearing large amounts of dust to find switches and chests, while the present has you moving platforms, turning gears, and even fighting enemies. On certain occasions, the automated platform sections intersect with other tasks, resulting in puzzles that require fast, critical thinking. There are so many great examples of puzzles involving the mechanics of Lanayru and the mining facility, so I won't spend too much time dissecting them. In truth, there are fantastic puzzles that inspire creative thinking all throughout Skyward Sword, and they are all built on the foundation laid out by your initial trips through those three regions. For instance, the Gust Bellows has a unique usage in the Fire Sanctuary. Just after you meet the magma hanging from a chain, you can wander through a hallway to find a key reachable with a claw shot. After grabbing it, you'll be stuck behind some magma. You can't run through it, and you can't claw shot back out. There's some dust on the ground nearby, which is your only clue that you're supposed to get rid of the magma with the gust bellows. That subtle hint, followed by the moment of realization, is just one thing that caused me to fall in love with Zelda in the first place. I love how I feel like I've been conditioned to thinking differently about my surroundings, and these moments are plentiful in Skyward Sword thanks to how smoothly it presents and tests its core concepts throughout the game. In the Fire Sanctuary, once again, you'll come into contact with these globs of water. By thrusting your sword into them, you can impale them on the blade and carry them around. There are two pieces to this. First, the action of thrusting your sword has been conveyed effectively in previous areas. Killing the giant spiders in Skyview meant flipping them around and then thrusting your sword into their weak points. You'd also have to turn the dials in Lanayru Desert by thrusting your sword into them. There are other instances with enemies and such, but the point is you learn how to thrust. Nice, very good. Keep thrusting. The second part of this puzzle is conveyed at the entrance to the dungeon with those frog statues. In order to put out the fire, you need to find a way to pour water onto the frog's tongue. With these globs, you now have instant access to water. All that's left is to put the pieces together. For a continuation of the observance tested in Skyview Temple, we should look at the ancient cistern. Now I love this dungeon for reasons beyond the puzzle I'm about to show you. The general aesthetic and theming of the dungeon is superb, the concept of trying to flip over lily pads by landing on them is great, your entrance into the boss room is contingent on your ability to shift the mysterious central statue, and the whip is a faster and more streamlined version of the grappling hook from Wind Waker, meaning that you can swing on things and steal things from enemies including a dungeon key. And you can turn switches and flip lily pads as well, transforming the way the player views the rest of the dungeon. There are instances where you'll have to look beyond iron bars to throw switches and steal a key with the whip, which is a phenomenal application for the item. As you continue delving deeper into the dungeon, you'll discover a stark contrast to the beauty that lies above. Because the cistern acts as a water purification system for Lake Floria, the sludge that gets extracted from the water is dumped into the lower floors. These floors are soaked in an eerie purple color, and zombified bokoblins will rise from the poison waters to attack you. Perhaps the most disturbing part of this dungeon is the part where you jump toward a rope that leads into a ray of light. As you jump for it, you'll fall into a pit of remains. The sea of bones is creepy enough, but as you begin to climb up, a swarm of zombie bokoblins will start climbing the rope as well. You can't climb fast enough to escape them, and they keep latching onto you as you ascend further into the light. It's incredibly unsettling, and in the end, the only one that gets to see that light once more is you. This dungeon is evocative of a feeling that I hadn't experienced since Ocarina of Time's Well. This was a place in which Hyrule allegedly kept and executed prisoners of war, and it was the kingdom's most well-kept secret. It revealed the dark side of a kingdom that you'd been told to fight for this whole time, and apparently it was built in place of the house of a man who saw the truth. The setting is shrouded in mystery, resulting in speculation and discussion to run rampant among Zelda fans for years. While the ancient cistern is more overt and less complex in its connection to the rest of the world, it does bring about similar feelings of morbid curiosity. Anyway, the dungeon is awesome, but there's a specific puzzle that is meant to be an extension of those rupees hinting toward the crystals in Skyview. After exploring the dungeon for a bit, you'll come across a door with an unusual lock. 
While you have a good chance of guessing the combination outright, most players will turn back and look for clues. Eventually you'll spot silver rupees sitting in each of the statue's hands underwater. As it turns out, the keys to the lock are painted on the statue's fists, and a nearby stone tablet will inform you of how you can put the pieces together. This puzzle is incredibly abstract, and that's why I'm okay with the tablet pointing me in the right direction. Simply figuring out what these clues are pointing to is satisfying. As you can see, the later dungeons all continue to be expansive tests of the concepts taught in their respective regions. And I do have one more dungeon to discuss that perfectly demonstrates this. But before I do, I have to talk about Skyward Sword's crowning achievement. The Lanayru Sand Sea. This whole area revolves around using a time shift stone to sail around the ocean with Captain Skipper. As you sail, you can see a glimpse into what the ocean used to be like, but the rest of your surroundings are shrouded in mystery. What these places used to look like are left entirely to the imagination. I'm kicking myself now for glossing over this part of the game in the past because its atmosphere is unmistakably close to my favorite Zelda game, Wind Waker. That feeling I get when I approach an unknown silhouetted island and discover its purpose has been perfectly recaptured here, despite being a linear experience. Each island serves a distinct purpose, and while the Shipyard minigame is pretty fun to gain speed in, the areas I want to talk about most are Skipper's Retreat and the Pirate Stronghold. Skipper's Retreat has you claw-shotting, bombing, fighting, and, uh, beetling your way up to the home of Skipper and his family. Once you arrive, you'll notice that a teensy bit of dust has accumulated since Skipper's time came to pass. You're supposed to simply pick up the sea chart that should lead you two to the sand ship and leave, but I couldn't help looking around his house first. He has paintings of the elusive sand ship throughout his house, and letters on the wall from his family and crewmates. It seems as though he devoted his entire life to looking for this ship, to the point where, had you not come to his aid, his family would have deactivated waiting for him to return. Upon staring at his family sitting there alone and deactivated, I knew I wanted to find that sand ship and change the past. The next area I wanted to discuss is the pirate stronghold, and for good reason. This place's menacing appearance on the outside only made it seem more inviting, and after finding the entrance and wandering through the interior, I found a portable time shift stone. Essentially, the puzzles in the pirate stronghold revolve around the positioning of this little orb and how it affects the area. Barbed wire in the present disappears in the past, while electric gates in the past disappear in the present. Enemies pop in and out of your radius as you wander around, and sand turns to grass just as it did in the desert. Sometimes you have to be very particular in where you place the orb, especially towards the end of the stronghold. It's a strong mini-dungeon and further evolves on the concept of time shift stones, which in turn prepares you for this area's dungeon, the Sand Ship. Before you can climb aboard the ship, you'll need to track it down, which isn't an easy task as it is completely invisible. You'll need to douse for its location, shoot in its approximate location, and make sure that no enemies disrupt your chase. You can't do all of these things at once, so it ends up being a pretty intense and challenging search. But the payoff is being able to climb aboard my favorite dungeon in the game. Now tracking this ship down brought me back to the days of searching for the ghost ship in Wind Waker. And while this process isn't nearly as involved as it is in that game, the reward being a dungeon seems to be a remnant of a Wind Waker we never got. In the final game, you are rewarded with a small combat room similar to those you find in a submarine and you grab yourself a Triforce chart. With confirmation from Al Numa that Wind Waker did have to scrap certain dungeons due to time constraints, I have no doubt that the ship being a full-fledged dungeon is something that we almost saw in Wind Waker. And had it accompanied that already phenomenal ghost ship quest, it probably would have been my favorite moment in any game I've ever played. With the Sand Ship, I have finally received some closure on what that would feel like. As for the dungeon, it rocks. I may be a sucker for pirate theming, but I genuinely think this is one of the coolest Zelda dungeons. All of its floors take place aboard a pirate ship, and it has all of the rooms and parts that you'd expect. After heading into the brig and solving one of these locks in order to collect the key to the captain's quarters, you'll find yourself locked in battle with the ship's captain. You trade blows with him and parry his electric sword until you eventually make him walk the plank. Perhaps some of the most fun I've had with Skyward Sword's combat, being locked in a one-on-one -on -one battle with a fearsome pirate captain, and the fun doesn't end there. With the bow, the sand ship's design is cracked wide open. First, you can shoot the time shift stone and check out the ship in the past. I adore climbing across the ship's masts and sniping the other archers, and if you're particularly observant, 
the claw shots will lead you to a piece of heart. Below deck, there are tricky spots for shooting arrows that take a careful eye to notice. And figuring out how to navigate the engine room means finding the correct time period to interact with the ship. This is what the rest of the dungeon revolves around, and it feels like a true culmination of everything that Skyward Sword teaches you. I suppose the Fire Sanctuary is a little more difficult at times if we're talking about avoiding hazards and dealing with enemies, but its obsession with the Magma Myths made it feel dull a lot of the time. The extravagance of the Lanayru Sand Sea and its dungeon left a much deeper impact on me. And to cap it all off, what would a pirate-themed dungeon be without a secret treasure room below deck and an epic Kraken attack? The way these three regions were designed and built upon left such a strong impression on me during the playthrough that changed my mind about Skyward Sword. With my now broadened perspective on Zelda, I realized just how strong its world and dungeon design could be. It toys with its core concepts resoundingly well. Its cohesive design informs and tests the player on concepts beautifully and seamlessly, and it has even more to offer above the clouds. After each visit to one of the primary regions, you'll return to the sky. When I first played this game, I didn't think very deeply about how the sky is used, but I've since realized that its structure isn't all that different from my favorite overworld in a Zelda game, The Great Sea. Of course, it isn't utilized to nearly the same extent, but the general philosophy of being able to freely explore the sky holds up in the end. While there are a few distinct floating islands outside of Skyloft like the Lumpy Pumpkin, Bug Rock, Fun Fun Island, and Bamboo Island, most of the sky is made up of small islands with puzzles for goddess chests. During your travels below the clouds, you'll come across goddess cubes. Upon hitting one with a skyward strike, a goddess chest on one of the floating islands in the sky will become openable. Finding a goddess cube could mean stumbling upon it by deviating from the main path, or perhaps by solving a puzzle like timing your skyward strike in a minecart, or using your sailcloth or claw shots to traverse treacherous terrain. From there, you'll head toward the chest location in the sky, maybe solve a puzzle that stands in your way, and the reward will be yours. Essentially, they're comparable to the treasure charts in Wind Waker, and I actually believe the goddess cubes are an improvement over them. I can't believe I'm saying that as such an avid fan of Wind Waker and a former detractor of Skyward Sword, but I think they work wonders in the context of Skyward Sword's design. In Wind Waker, treasure charts were treated in the same way, but the most common rewards were rupees. You could also find heart pieces and bonus charts that help you gain a deeper understanding of the Great Sea's many secrets, but they were littered with rupee rewards for a critical reason. The endgame Triforce Shard quest required you to decipher 3,184 rupees worth of charts. While solving puzzles, clearing combat caves, finding them in dungeons, and all of the other ways you could find treasure charts made them feel rewarding, they essentially introduced an extra step before you could actually collect the money. While I am a big fan of how rupee collecting and management feeds into the world of Wind Waker, I understand that the mandatory nature of rupees made farming treasure chart rewards a pain in the neck for some. Goddess Cube rewards are far more diverse than treasure chart rewards, and the items you obtain from them reveal an incredible layer of depth to Skyward Sword's item management. In addition to heart pieces and rupees, you can also net yourself a bomb bag upgrade, a quiver upgrade, an empty bottle, and several different medals, all of which you can equip in your adventure pouch. Your adventure pouch is where your shield, empty bottles, and medals go. These items are no longer safely tucked away in the pause menu. There is genuine strategy and risk versus reward at play when managing the items in your pouch. For instance, it's best to carry a shield in order to parry and deflect enemy attacks, but if you decide that you're too cool for defense and you're content with dodging up a storm, you don't have to waste an inventory slot on a shield at all. Perhaps you're looking to buy an extra pouch slot from Beetle, but you're short on funds. You could keep the rupee medal in your pouch so that you find more rupees in the grass and rocks throughout your adventure. Maybe you're looking to upgrade that shield of yours, but you don't have enough materials to craft it. The treasure medal is for you, as carrying it means enemies drop materials more often. Also worth mentioning is that quiver, seed satchel, and bomb bag upgrades have to be carried in your pouch as well. So that's another element to consider if you find yourself using a lot of ammo. But by far, my favorite strategy to play with involves the potion medal. It increases the duration of potions you drink, which means that you could cram your pouch with stamina potions, combine them with the metal, and gain access to an incredible amount of stamina when you're feeling you need it most. This is an emphatic method of dealing with stamina management if you're struggling with it, and thanks to the potion infusion mechanic increasing the capabilities of the potions you buy, if you're smart enough with your rupees and materials, you could potentially go about Skyward Sword's most stamina draining levels with an unlimited amount of stamina. 
That's not hyperbole either. An infused stamina potion gives you unlimited stamina for a few minutes, and you can double that period with the potion medal. When people say they aren't a big fan of the stamina meter, to some extent I can empathize. But when I remember the ways in which the adventure pouch can transform a playthrough of Skyward Sword, I feel as though those people didn't experiment with it enough. There are so many possibilities for mixing and matching, and as the game continues to increase in difficulty, your adventure pouch strategies, big or small, can pay tremendous dividends. Also available for purchase at the bazaar are three different shields. You can buy the wooden shield from the beginning, but the iron and sacred shields come after progressing through the game. The wooden shield is weak to fire, the iron shield is more durable but conducts electricity, and the sacred shield has no elemental weaknesses and can repair itself over time, but it is dangerously brittle and needs upgrades before it can be fully effective. Its steep price tag and the commitment required usually scare me away. I'm a much bigger fan of upgrading the iron shield for maximum durability. Of course, that's just one approach. I've seen people use an upgraded wooden shield throughout most of the game, while I've also seen people gun it for the sacred shield as soon as it becomes available. This, in addition to everything else that I've discussed, keeps me coming back to the bazaar every time I solve a dungeon. And on top of all of that, there's something so comforting about this place becoming a constant in my journey. The music is soothingly upbeat, and each section of the bazaar has its own unique take on the instrumentation to suit the stands being run. All of this is a long-winded way of demonstrating how systematically rich a playthrough of Skyward Sword can be. In spite of the negative perceptions of Skyward Sword's linearity, its levels feature self-contained sandboxes, its goddess cubes inspire further exploration of the world, and the adventure pouch allows the player to experiment of their own accord. And if all of that weren't enough, the ways in which you collect heart pieces don't at all adhere to the linear sense of progression Skyward Sword carries, pushing you even further out into the world. The heart pieces of Skyward Sword are implemented just about everywhere. Some are hidden along your main path, a couple of them flesh out certain concepts in dungeons like the beetle or the claw shots, some of them are locked behind goddess chests, while others are rewards for side quests and thinking outside of the box either in the sky or during your revisits to the various regions. They cover a broad amount of Skyward Sword's content, encouraging players to break out of the game's routine and experience everything it has to offer to get stronger. In that regard, I think it makes the game less linear than Twilight Princess. In that game, two heart pieces could be found in every dungeon, while most others were found along your main path with some clever and creative thinking. A select few were rewards for deviating from that path, but these didn't leave much of a dent in the game's linearity. Skyward Sword has them everywhere, and they could lead to a deeper understanding of the game's systems. The Lumpy Pumpkin side quest grants you two heart pieces in total, and while carrying Super Round, you'll learn more about the effectiveness of empty bottles in your adventure pouch. This led me to experiment with the metals, and delivering the soup led me to explore Skyloft for Gratitude Crystals, which meant another heart piece and wallet upgrades from Betro. With so much genuine freedom at play in Skyward Sword, I had to ask myself why I would ever consider this game too linear at one point. Nearly every Zelda game to follow the original has been linear, and while dungeons could be completed in any order in Zelda 1, there was a progression in difficulty across its dungeons. Also, an item you'd obtain in one dungeon would lead to another. The world had cohesion. What was truly freeform were the methods in which you would explore and discover these things. To me, a good Zelda game should balance both of these things. A sense of interrelatedness in its mechanics and design can be more easily achieved through linearity, while a sense of freedom in how you discover those things doesn't necessitate the need for an overall non-linear structure. Zelda has since been able to balance these two things in distinct and creative ways. I've discussed examples of this on my channel at length, including some that I showcased at the beginning of this chapter, and I believe Skyward Sword fits right in with that description. The continuity in its level design is rock solid, and it greatly rewards players for digging deeper and looking beyond the scope of the linear structure. The game is fun. Where all of this freedom and design cohesion finally apexes is the Sky Keep. This is the final dungeon of Skyward Sword. Each room calls back to a dungeon or region you visited over the course of your adventure. There's design elements from the Ancient Cistern, the Earth Temple, the Leneru Mining Facility, the Fire Sanctuary, the Sand Ship, and the Pirate Stronghold, all thrown into a blender to create a relentless gauntlet of puzzles and combat. Certain concepts specific to one region are made applicable to another without compromising on theming, and I had no idea what to expect in each room. The Earth Temple section has you using multiple items to locate and strike crystals in a specific order. 
The Fire Sanctuary section has you creating platforms on the lava and riding them out. All the while making sure that you think on your feet and create the next one before your current one crumbles. While it takes patience to do this, I had a ton of fun solving it. Of course, a gauntlet like this wouldn't exactly be new to Zelda. And that's why it's time to talk about the central mechanic the Skykeep revolves around. With this slider puzzle, you can move and connect each room in the dungeon in any formation you like. Each terminal you find will prevent the room you're currently in from moving, which allows you to look at your constructed dungeon from a different angle each time. This mechanic means that the dungeon can be solved in multiple different ways. Each time I play this game, I get the required items in a different order. You create your own solution, and for a linear game, the Skykeep is a non-linear marvel. If it wasn't already obvious, I have fostered a deep admiration for the framework Skyward Sword has in place, and I am now confident in saying that it is a smart game. But, there is a difference between being smart and being wise. The game doesn't always feel like a culmination of how far Zelda has come. While this game can feel like a step forward and a bold approach to Zelda's conventions, some of its ideas can feel like a step backwards and at times you can feel the impact that time constraints and franchise fatigue had on the team when crafting this game. Even now, certain aspects that I've grown quite fond of also conflict me and cause me to question the longevity of what I've come to know as Zelda. I've been able to set aside my initial emotional and reactionary response to this game, and I still think that a lot of things that it does right are often countered by the things that it does wrong. With this wisdom that I've accumulated since the game's release, I think I should finally express my conflicting emotions towards Skyward Sword. Later in the video we will address some justifications and contextualization for Skyward Sword's conflicting design. Because even though the game often makes mistakes, there is intent and a sense of direction in all of its positives and negatives. But for now, I need to talk things out. I love the Lanayru Sand Sea, but there's a critical detail that I have neglected to mention until now. Despite taking heavy inspiration from Wind Waker, there are only three islands for you to visit, and most egregious is the fact that you have to visit them in a specific order. Also, aside from a revisit to the minecart minigame, there is virtually no reason to return to the sea. This might seem like a minor annoyance, but it reinforces the arguments against Skyward Sword's linearity. If they were to fill the Sand Sea with more things to do, have smaller islands with optional goodies to uncover, and ultimately leave your path up to you to figure out, this would have been one of the best areas in a Zelda game, hands down. They had this incredible scenario in which they could craft a miniature sandbox within Lanayru, and they instead craft something linear. I can't help but wonder about what might have been. The quests in Faron and Elden during the game's second act are similarly straightforward. Faron has you scaling the Great Tree and swimming through Lake Floria before you can enter the Ancient Cistern. Sure, you fight enemies on your way there and learn how the swimming controls, but you don't deviate much from the main path unless you want to hit a goddess cube. I'll admit, it's pretty cool doing this. Perhaps the worst part about this quest is that they have you re-enter Skyview Temple and navigate through the same rooms you've already solved just to fetch some water for the Dragon of Faron. While these rooms are now filled with new enemies, this is a very strange precedent to be set in a Zelda game, and I don't entirely understand the thought process behind doing this. In Elden, you'll have to walk back and forth between a pond and the Gates of Fire before the Fire Sanctuary asks you to recall a basin large enough to carry the amount of water needed to douse the final flames. This is a pretty neat test of your memory, but instead of just warping on over to the entrance from there, the game forces you to race Skipper up Elden Volcano, which you will have already climbed twice by that point, potentially more if you're the explorative type. They do give a logistical reason for this, but you have to wonder why they'd commit to such an idea in the first place. I mean, you stumble through a linear puzzle before the game forces you to re-experience content that you've already seen, and I think that, unfortunately, summarizes a lot of Skyward Sword after its first act concludes. Skyward Sword does offer more freedom than it would lead you to believe in a lot of cases, and I've expanded on how they accomplished this. But I know exactly where the negative connotations attached to Skyward Sword's linearity stem from. So many of its design choices are questionable to say the least, and it would be misleading for me to act as if the game were a spotless gem. This game has left me with many questions, and while I've been able to conclusively answer some of these questions for myself, others have left me dumbfounded. 
So many of its worst elements have glimmers of brilliance, while many of its best elements are brought down by the game's laundry list of issues. I gotta work through my conflicting feelings, so let's get into it. Let's start by extrapolating on that focus I praised earlier. The game pivots after the Laneru mining facility from its profound and semi-open take on level design to a more reserved and linear approach. This continues through to the end of the game, with the Song of the Hero quest requiring you to visit each region one last time. So that's three visits to the three regions over the course of the game. As demonstrated by the genius of the Sand Sea, these revisits can allow you to foster a deeper appreciation for each region. It's not that the regions are dull upon returning, it's what they have you do that brings these revisits down. And while this normally would give the designers more opportunities to mature the mechanics they've introduced, the fact that there are only three regions heavily limits the variety of things you can interact with in the end. To counteract this, certain quests needed to be extremely transformative. And I don't think they always do the job. These quests are all over the place. You have absolute bangers like the Laneru Sand Sea and the stealthy adventure to reclaim your stolen items across Elden Volcano, in the same breath as quests where you have to awkwardly swim around a flooded Faron Woods and collect music notes. That segment in Elden Volcano was so transformative that I wasn't even bothered by the fact that I was exploring the same area for the gazillionth time. Every single item you find during that sequence gradually opens up new possibilities across the volcano. Meanwhile, collecting music notes with less control over your character or fetching water over and over again to enter a dungeon aren't exactly compelling quests. But I think the greatest casualty in endlessly revisiting the only three regions in the game is this segment in Laneru Gorge. This segment has everything I've praised about the ever-expanding design of Laneru. It expands upon the time shift stones and the moving carts that appear in the mining facility with so many different set pieces. Enemies entering and exiting the stone's radius, quick use of your items to navigate and clear obstacles, and more. It has everything that I've come to love about this region, and I should be enjoying every second of this section. And yet, I'm not, because I've gone through these motions so many times already. If there were more than three regions, and if you didn't revisit them nearly as often, I have no doubt that I'd be singing a different tune. But that's one of the biggest problems with Skyward Sword. It loves to repeat content. Skyward Sword's tendency to repeat itself is like a plague. It creeps into so many corners of this game's design until it has infected things that you once might have liked or even loved. Take the fight with Girahim, for example. He is the boss of the Skyview Temple, and he is a fantastic test of your swordsmanship up to that point. You have to avoid letting him catch your blade in his fingers, dodge his sword slashes, swipe in the direction of his projectiles, and find openings. It forces you to up the ante on your sword fighting. Girahim returns as the boss for the sixth dungeon, the Fire Sanctuary. He has a few new tricks up his sleeve and it makes for a fun rematch, but I couldn't help but feel cheated out of a proper dungeon boss that utilized the Magma Mitts. This isn't the most egregious example though. The Moldorok fight is awesome. You slice in the direction of its claws, thrust your sword into its eye, jump out of the way of its attacks, and use the Gust Bellows to dig it up when it burrows. Exemplary Skyward Sword combat. However, the boss reappears out of nowhere in the Laneru Sand Sea in the shipyard. I suppose you could argue that these rematches allow you to see how far you've come, but I think that sentiment is more applicable to Girahim than it is to Moldorok. At least Girahim fights you at the beginning and end of your journey, and he has a purpose in the game's narrative. Moldorok reappears out of nowhere and feels out of place. But if you want a truly awful example of repetition in Skyward Sword's content, look no further than the Imprisoned. This thing is a little infamous for making sudden reappearances. Your first fight with this thing has you sluggishly chasing after it and chopping off its toes. You need to do this while avoiding the shockwaves from its footsteps. Once you're done, it falls over and you give it three slices to the noggin. You do this three times before it can reach the temple, and you're done. Skyward Sword seems to have a fetish for the number three, and its lust for making the player revisit content only further exposes the problems with Skyward Sword's approach to linearity. Only three regions, three major visits to each region, only three islands in the Sand Sea, three revisits to the Isle of Songs in which you watch the same cutscene, three sacred flames to collect in which you watch the same cutscene, three fights with Girahim counting the final boss, three hits to kill the Imprisoned, and if you can believe it, three entire fights with the Imprisoned. I'm not kidding. 
Aside from the addition of a bomb catapult that stops the thing from flying upward to a higher level of the sealed grounds, the boss fight remains virtually identical, and the two rematches can potentially show up back to back. One of the cool things about the Song of the Hero quest is that you can actually revisit each region in any order you like. This doesn't matter much in the grand scheme of things, but if you decide you want to see Lanayru's final quest before Faron, you can. Of course, there was a bug when the game came out that hardlocked your save data when you go to Lanayru first, forcing Nintendo to push a save data update channel, which was awkward, but that issue has since been resolved, so now, it's still pretty cool. Anyway, the first rematch with the Imprisoned takes place after the Fire Sanctuary, and if you decide to go to Faron first afterwards for the Song of the Hero quest, you'll be fighting the Imprisoned twice within the same hour on an average playthrough. It's worth mentioning that the Dragon Lanayru will offer you a chance to refight all of the bosses in a boss rush. This includes the rematches with all of the bosses, making for a total of 9 boss fights, including 2 fights with Girihim and all 3 fights with the Imprisoned. Also, the contents of your adventure pouch are off limits. You can drink invincibility and stamina potions beforehand, but you must proceed onward with scattered heart pickups being your only means of healing. Now you might be wondering why I would ever want to refight the bosses in a game with so many rematches, but in truth, the rewards for braving this thing are the final piece of heart for beating 4 bosses in a row, and the illustrious Hylian shield for beating 8. There may not be much of a reason to go after a shield that never breaks this late in the game, especially if you've been upgrading your shields over the course of your adventure, but I mean come on, it's the Hylian shield, I need it. I'm going to be parrying a lot anyway during the final boss, so it's worth having if I end up fumbling my timing. Anyway, the caveat to having these two rewards is that you can only claim one reward per run. This means 12 rematches at the very least if you want to 100% the game. Also, the boss order throughout your run is completely randomized, meaning that you could potentially fight the Imprisoned three times in the span of 15 to 20 minutes. And because Imprisoned rematches make up for a third of the boss pool, there's a pretty good chance of this happening. The boss rush itself is a fantastic idea, because as I have discussed already and I will continue to expand upon later, the bosses in Skyward Sword are usually phenomenal. It's the rematches that bring the whole experience down. While recording for this video, I fought the Imprisoned a total of 7 times. And that's not counting the B-roll I recorded for Skyward Sword HD. Three of those fights were mandatory, while the other four were at the mercy of the random boss order. At one point I fought the Imprisoned twice in a row during the boss rush. Needless to say, I was sick to death of this thing. This boss right here is the ugliest example of why Skyward Sword's repetition can often be its worst aspect, and this repetition does not help at times when the game is decidedly linear. If I were to summarize why I hated Skyward Sword all those years ago, my answer would be all over the place. But with the wisdom I have now, I think I can point to repetition as Skyward Sword's fatal flaw, at least to me. The boss rush may have accentuated the issue, but even disregarding that, the constant revisitation of its level design and boss concepts water down what should be compelling uses of said concepts. Skyward Sword feels like a broken record, as the best parts of the record are being repeated to an obnoxious degree thanks to the scratches in the vinyl. With all of this in mind, there are a few counter-arguments worth mentioning. While the rematches with the Imprisoned are a major pain, the fight itself being so dull has actually caused people to find an alternative method in killing it in turn circling back to the encouragement of player freedom, and raising a potential positive argument against the bitterness toward repetition. If you grow weary of chopping off all of its toes, it will be an absolute delight to discover that you can actually jump off of a higher level of the sealed grounds, and land on its head to quickly give it a slash and skip the toe chopping. This reminds me of stuff like using the Megaton Hammer on Dark Link, distracting Ganondorf with a fishing rod or hookshotting the box in the house by Lake Hylia. The emergent solutions that have come about from passionate Zelda players exploring its mechanics are alive and well in Skyward Sword, even in instances where experimentation seems impossible. There's also a prominent thematic reason the Imprisoned and its constant re-emergences matter to the world of Skyward Sword, but I think it's best to save that for later. Here's the thing about Skyward Sword. It strives to be accessible. Its areas aren't always fueled by exploration because it wants new players to be introduced to the flow of Zelda's combat and puzzles. As I've discussed, it does this tremendously well in most areas. But aside from certain quests that let you approach things at your own discretion, where freedom continues to play a part in its design is in its systems, heart pieces, and a certain series of trials that I have failed to mention until now. The Silent Realm trials occur during your second series of visits to the three regions, 
and once more at the end of the game in Skyloft. If you remember the Tears of Light quests from Twilight Princess, these are essentially the same idea with much better execution. While Twilight Princess's Tears of Light were introductions to the areas you'd be visiting, the Silent Realm trials are instead tests of your knowledge of these areas. In the Silent Realm, you have no health and no items, just your stamina meter. The tears are scattered all throughout a confined area in each region, and as soon as you step outside of the circle, you'll start being chased by the terrifying guardians of the realm. Collecting a tear will reset their positions and prevent them from chasing you for 90 seconds, while a light fruit can briefly shine a beacon on the remaining tears. Also, watchers will follow you if you get too close to them, and if they catch you, they'll reawaken the guardians. Water will also cause the guardians to wake up. That said, you have complete freedom to collect the tears however you like. You can choose to save the more dangerous areas for later, but it might be better to approach them first and get them over with. There are puzzles built into the trials, and certain tiers ask you to think outside of the box over an area that you might think you're already familiar with. Because these trials involve a lot of running and climbing, they end up being beautiful tests of your stamina management, especially in Elden Volcano and Laneiru Desert because of their terrain, and when you find yourself running for your life in search of another tier when a guardian is on your tail. Skyloft's Silent Realm is claustrophobic, but that's exactly what makes it so much fun. A simple hub that you've been able to familiarize yourself with over the course of the game has become a playground for anxiety. The Silent Realm Trials are an example of repetition with purpose in Skyward Sword, as you're forced to view these regions you once explored leisurely from a practical and intense perspective. This is also why I love the stealth section of Elden Volcano during the Song of the Hero quest. You start out with the magma mitts and have to slowly work your way through each portion of the volcano, avoiding detection by bokoblins and sneaking by watchtowers along the way you gradually gain new ways to push back against the restrictions of this area, eventually being able to bomb watchtowers and stuff. It does kind of awkwardly end with you finding the rest of your items in a chest, but this whole segment is an example of linearity and repetition with purpose. In many ways, I think Skyward Sword's approach to balancing accessible world design with deeply rewarding mechanics has its high points. But the price of accessibility can often be observed. While the ideas on display in the game's first three dungeons are often inspired and immensely fun to play with, I think the layouts of these dungeons leave a lot to be desired. Skyview Temple, the Earth Temple, and the Laneru Mining Facility all take place across one floor, and they often follow a linear sense of progression between rooms. The potential for lateral thinking is limited by this approach, and while the later three dungeons pick up the slack, I think the simplistic layouts of these dungeons played a huge part in driving me away when I first played the game. As weird as it is for Skyview to only have one floor, I think its focus on the core puzzle solving warrants a step back from complex layouts. Skyview's central hub is fun to solve, and that fun continues through the examination of your surroundings with the beetle and whatnot. But the Earth Temple doesn't get a pass. While I had fun solving its hub for reasons I discussed earlier, the path you take after finding the bomb bag, solving all of those puzzles, and blowing up the crack in the wall is shockingly straightforward. You roll the ball around the lava, occasionally hop off for some combat or a brief puzzle, and before you know it you'll have the boss key and you'll be right in front of the boss door. Seriously, you walk up a hill, grab the key from the chest, run away from the giant rolling ball that drops from the dragon's mouth, and the end result is a straight path to the boss door. While it is a nifty set piece and sets up the dungeon boss pretty well, it also reflects poorly on the dungeon's linearity. And while I adore the puzzles and rooms in the mining facility, I also feel like the manner in which you progress through its single floor layout doesn't feed into any of the dungeon's overall challenge. As demonstrated by this puzzle with a lifeboat on the sand ship, you can do some pretty cool things with multiple floors in a dungeon, and I feel Skyward Sword's aversion to using floors as a moving part in dungeon design limits the creative potential that we've seen in countless other Zelda dungeons. And that is what was lost in attempting to create accessible dungeons. On top of all this, the items in Skyward Sword are generally underwhelming. Like, they all have great applications, but the item is usually one we've seen before, it doesn't reach its fullest potential, or it's a slow-moving beetle. I don't have a problem with seeing the bow or the bombs again. They're staples of the Zelda series, and bombs in particular have unique uses in Skyward Sword, as demonstrated earlier. You can even fill up your bomb bag with bomb flowers now, proving that the merchants of previous Zelda games were scamming people all along. I'm also a big fan of the claw shots, as some of you may already know, and Skyward Sword uses them pretty well along your main path and in exploring for secrets. However, the new items are rather disappointing. 
I liked using the whip in the ancient cistern, but its unique applications outside of the dungeon are painfully lacking. On top of that, you can only steal from red bokoblins, whereas the Wind Waker let you steal from nearly every enemy in the game. Considering Wind Waker had multiple quests revolving around the spoils bag and this game has a similar system using materials for upgrades, it seems like a huge missed opportunity not to revisit this mechanic. Perhaps you shouldn't be able to steal the most rare materials, but being able to steal common and uncommon materials would be much appreciated. Using the Gust Bellows in the mining facility is fun, but it only ever shows up again during the Isle of Songs quest and a couple of times in Laneru, and both uses never feel truly unique. What if the Gust Bellows could also push objects around, forcing a player to interact with a robust physics simulation for a puzzle for example? Maybe that's impractical, but bombs already have a simulation in place. If they were to implement it for a puzzle or two, that would be admirable. And then there's the beetle. Uh, okay, this thing's problems don't stem from its utility. I've seen plenty of creative uses for this thing. In the Earth Temple, there's a moment in which you have to fly the beetle once at the front of the gate, and again by flying around it to open the gate and get through. In Skyview Temple, you can use it to scope out this room and unlock a piece of heart. In Laneru Gorge, the shimmering of a key on a platform below is enough of a hint toward using the beetle to fetch it. These are all great applications for the item, and there are plenty more. But the root of the problem is that you are forced to control an incredibly sluggish flying beetle in order to solve these puzzles. And Skyward Sword is obsessed with this thing. Despite it being the least interesting item, its utility is through the roof. Why? Perhaps this is because it familiarizes you with your surroundings, but the game does this in many other ways too. Why focus so much attention on crafting challenges for such an item? I think the lack of interesting items is yet another unfortunate result of the game only having three regions. If they were to create one region for each dungeon, resulting in six overall regions, and cut out the unnecessary revisits to each dungeon while encouraging players to check them out anyways for secrets later down the line, Skyward Sword would have been a much better game. But of course, the revisits are essential to the game's design. It's a double-edged sword. Even the setting that inspired the double entendre in the game's title, the sky, feels limited. While there are unique puzzles, quests, and challenges to be found throughout the sky, it certainly doesn't reach its fullest potential. While the possibilities for exploration spring to life as you find goddess cubes along the main path, that's just it. The goddess cubes are usually discovered throughout the game's linear progression. There are exceptions to this, but this is true for most of the ones you'll discover. As a result, Exploration feels like a byproduct of this game's linearity, rather than rewards for seeking out islands like in Wind Waker. This doesn't mean the process of finding goddess cubes is boring, hell no, but this doesn't allow the sky to truly feel like the freeform alternative to the main path that it could have been. On top of that, it isn't nearly as fun to gawk at as the Great Sea was. The ocean's breathtaking blue and the silhouetted islands becoming distinct visual marvels is a feeling I dearly miss. Perhaps I just want a game like Wind Waker again, but if the regions felt like linear events that broke away from the open-ended nature of the sky, this game could have struck a perfect balance between linearity and exploration. We'd still have the goddess cubes unlocking goddess chests across the sky, but maybe you'd also have some recognizable floating islands everywhere with fleshed out puzzles that you can solve for rare materials, heart pieces, and other upgrades. If only. I mean, I could go on. I could talk about dowsing and how I dislike what it takes away from certain exploratory scenarios, particularly when they force you to re-enter a region and douse for the location of a trial, meaning a lot of pointless backtracking unless you know exactly which bird statue to land at. I could talk about how 5 spoils certain puzzle solutions in the original game anyway. And I could talk about the fact that Tentalus's weak point is hilariously obvious, but I feel like these things are relatively easy targets and have been discussed countless times. But without a doubt, no element of this game has proved more controversial than the crux of its gameplay. Its controls. People have debated the necessity and reliability of Skyward Sword's motion controls since before the game was even released. But in truth, the motion-based combat is one of the elements of this game that I am least conflicted on. I think Skyward Sword's combat is remarkable, and it remains one of the most consistently endearing and rewarding things about this game amidst its highest highs, and lowest lows. Link's movements mirroring my own made the game feel all the more immersive. With that said, I am more conflicted on how everyone else will acclimate to it. It is impossible to take into account the way every human being moves and their mannerisms. 
Some may find Skyward Sword's motion controls 100% accurate, while others will find them unreliable. Discussion of the game's control is incredibly subjective, but I believe the notion of requiring motion controls clashes with the accessibility that the designers often strived for. I mean, after all, I was playing this game from a hospital bed in 2011. I think it's fair to say that I would have preferred a traditional control scheme back then. Of course, my situation was unique, but so is everyone else's, that's my point. Also, there isn't even a left-handed mode. Unfortunately, this would have been very tricky to implement as retooling all of Link's animations for those playing in a left-handed mode would have been more expensive than necessary. And I'm pretty sure they also wanted to avoid mirroring the game for lefties like Twilight Princess on the Wii. This leaves 10% of the population with potential difficulties adapting to the control scheme, forcing them to use their non-dominant hand to varying degrees of success. Now, the landscape for discussing Skyward Sword's controls has completely changed with the release of Skyward Sword HD. While there still isn't a left-handed mode, it successfully preserved the original experience while offering a new alternative, and it streamlines all of the right elements of the game as a whole. By understanding how Skyward Sword was released in its original form, I think you'll gain a much deeper appreciation for what Skyward Sword HD achieved. There are plenty of changes that I deeply respect in this remaster, including faster text speed and the bump to 60 frames per second, but there are two in particular I want to discuss. In the original game, your companion character Phi had this annoying tendency to spoil puzzle solutions that might seem too difficult. This happens in a few dungeons, but no example is more egregious than this one in the Sand Ship. In order to proceed, you need to find a way to activate a Time Shift Stone. The only clue toward the solution is the light shaft shining through a grate in the deck. By looking through it, you can spot an angle to shoot the time shift stone and proceed. Solving this puzzle proceeds to inspire the solutions to other puzzles, like this one where you shoot through the propeller. It's an incredible puzzle. Or at least, it would be if Phi didn't point it out for you and ruin the feeling of satisfaction you get from solving a difficult puzzle like this. In Skyward Sword HD, she no longer does this. She shuts up and lets you figure things out on your own. Thank you so very much. I know I said I wouldn't talk about Phi spoiling things, but I have to give credit where credit is due. Skyward Sword HD is a blessing. The other change I wanted to discuss is the implementation of a button-based control scheme. While you can still use the original motion controls in Skyward Sword HD thanks to the Joy-Cons, the game also offers the alternative of using an analog stick to swing your sword. You flick the stick in the desired direction, and you swing your sword in that direction. You click the stick in to thrust, you click the left stick in to parry, and you perform spin attacks by quickly flicking west to east or north to south, and obviously vice versa works too. Ironically, this is a far more accessible method of playing Skyward Sword for a lot of people. And while it does have some input latency in my experience, I believe this method will allow many to foster a newfound appreciation for Skyward Sword's combat. And that's a wonderful thing, because combat is easily the element of Skyward Sword with the most thought and passion put into it. I'm going to assume that you have a vague understanding of how combat can flourish in Skyward Sword, as you've been watching this video long enough to see some examples. You swing your sword in 8 directions, and the game challenges your ability to swing in those 8 directions. Sometimes enemies will switch their positioning on the fly, sometimes attacks will come at you from specific angles, and sometimes you'll need to parry attacks by thrusting your nunchuck forward at the right time, or whatever is the equivalent to your control scheme. It's actually a pretty simple combat system, it's the constant stream of unique scenarios they put you in that make it extraordinary. After learning the basics in the practice range, your first encounter will be with a Boko Baba plant. You can only attack these things from the angles in which their mouths are aligned. This first introduces players to the concept of accuracy in their swings, and they've done this with a stationary enemy. Much like the game's level design, they continually expand on this core concept, gradually increasing in challenge. Next up is the Bokoblin. These things will attempt to predict your sword slashes, so it's up to you to either outsmart them, or parry their swings and stagger them. These guys persist throughout the entire game, sometimes showing up in hordes, and the nature in which they attack constantly keeps you on your toes. Their whole shtick is a common theme with Skyward Sword's enemies. Oftentimes, you can't just mindlessly slash to deal with them. They one-up the Bokoblins with the mini-boss in the Skyview Temple. This boss has two swords, meaning that you can only attack from very specific angles. If you slice in the wrong direction, you'll be punished and you'll have to quickly react. Then comes Girahim at the end of the dungeon. 
I've touched upon his design already, but he requires even more specific slashes and smarter swordplay in order to beat him. Then comes these armored Lazalfos, which move faster and more unpredictably than the previous enemies. In Lanero, you fight these technological beasts. These statues require two focused slashes and a thrust, while these flying robots require a parry and specific slices to take down. Then there's these moblins that block narrow pathways and convey the effectiveness of the shield parry. The point I'm trying to make with all of these enemies is that every single one asks something different of your swordsmanship. Whether we're talking about a simple Boko Baba plant or a dungeon boss like Moldorok, great use of the sword is a constant in Skyward Sword. And that's not even mentioning the many uses of the parry. If you can't find an opening, you can use a well-timed parry to deflect an attack and stagger your enemy. It works on most attacks and rewards patient players for playing defensively. It even has uses outside of combat that continue to astound me. Like I had absolutely no idea that you could parry an Ampelus as it's rolling toward you. And I discovered this as a last resort as it was chasing after me. I cannot properly articulate the satisfaction of doing this. Especially with the motion controls. And that's why it's a shame that not everyone could acclimate to them. As for the bosses... Oh man. Whether we're talking about some mini-bosses or full-fledged dungeon bosses, they're a lot of fun. I've highlighted some of my favorites already, like slicing off Moldorok's claws and countering Girahim's tricks, but I cannot go without mentioning Kalaktos. Oh my god, this boss. This thing has six arms and it packs a hell of a punch. You first need to dodge its attacks, and then rip off its arms as they get stuck to the ground. Eventually its weak point is exposed, wherein you can go ham. It'll throw its crossblades at you, swing at you from multiple different angles, and even fake you out with a different arm. After a while though, it stands up and draws six massive swords. The range of his swings are much harder to avoid, but if you do, you can tear off his arms, avoid the other swings, pick up one of his swords that you ripped off of him, tear through the rest of his arms, chop off his legs, and just go absolutely friggin' bananas. This part is so violent, and I absolutely love it. This spectacle is still there if you choose to play with a normal controller, but swinging the Wii Remote to kick this thing's teeth in is one of the most satisfying things I've ever experienced in a Zelda game. And the music! I suppose now is as good a time as any to go on a tangent about Skyward Sword's soundtrack. After Super Mario Galaxy's live orchestral soundtrack went over so well, Nintendo finally decided to give Zelda the same treatment with Skyward Sword, and to this day it still sweeps me off my feet. No matter how many times I fly through the sky, the horns always keep it feeling bombastic and freeing. Although you hear a certain piece for all three of the Sacred Flames, it is awe-inspiring. The Hyrule Symphony Orchestra, as they are known in the game's credits, are astounding performers and hearing the fullness and organic nature of live instruments is something that Zelda has deserved for far too long. I'll be delving into more specifics on the soundtrack later, but if I didn't gush now, I wouldn't have found an appropriate chance otherwise. Anyway, in spite of the stink it has caused, combat is easily the most consistently challenging and fulfilling element of Skyward Sword. It even justifies the starting six hearts instead of three, as the intimate nature of combat requires players to have more breathing room in the beginning. If anything, the real issue with the motion controls is how superficially they were implemented in certain areas. Certain mechanics thrive with this control scheme like aiming with the bow or claw shots. Pulling back the nunchuck as if you were drawing a real bow readies a shot quicker and feels so natural. It's a feeling that has only been replicated convincingly to me in virtual reality games. Other mechanics, however, aren't really improved by motion control. The necessity of motion control is especially brought into question when swimming, flying, controlling that pesky little beetle, and especially when throwing yourself at the shipyard minigame on a time limit for a piece of heart. It's doable with a Wii Remote, but I find it much more fun to attempt in Skyward Sword HD 
because you can use the analog stick to lean with the track's turns. While I was performing all of these actions with most of my dominant arm, I quickly came to the realization that these actions could be just as easily performed with the analog stick that happens to be resting under my thumb, not doing anything. I adored trying to land on top of Levias with Skyward Sword HD's button controls, whereas I didn't feel the same enjoyment in the original. Also, I swear that diving is the most inaccurate action in this game, and the side quest at Fun Fun Island is ridiculously difficult because you don't have the accuracy of a thumbstick to clear these rings and time your landing. Of course, maybe that's just me. Like I said, the response to the controls seems to be different for everyone, bringing us right back to that same conflicted place. As it stands, I am very conflicted on Skyward Sword. I like it a lot more than I used to, but I recognize that it could be much better in many ways and perhaps the team wanted it to be more than it was. I suspect that time constraints were the reason the game felt incomplete and confused, as Nintendo wanted to create a swan song for the Wii before going all in on the Wii U. Since the game was built for a standard definition console, a cross-platform release would have been awkward and possibly impractical, and if it were to gain another year for the designers to craft more regions, or dungeons, it would have released at the tail end of the Wii's life in a cramped release window for Nintendo. Also, the life medals that give you two extra heart containers clearly feel like they didn't have time to design two more dungeons to accompany them. Just saying. With everything that I've said being out there, I need to ask, was Skyward Sword an example of the Zelda formula showing its first gray hairs as contemporary critics put it? Or did the game simply mishandle a rock-solid formula? People are still discovering new ways to play with the conventions of Zelda in their own games, and people are still replaying Zelda games endlessly. Zelda randomizers take the philosophy of items enabling progression and unlocking secrets and create a puzzle box based around knowledge of the game in question. And I mean, I still replay these games all the time. Clearly these games continue to leave an impact. I think Skyward Sword's messy focus was what made people question the team's willingness to commit to such a formula after so many years. 25 years, in fact. It wasn't necessarily the conventions that fans were growing tired of, it was the way they were handled in Skyward Sword. All of the boxes were being ticked for a Zelda game, but every time they wanted to take a step forward in one area, they take a step back in another. Not enough was being done to truly innovate on what this formula was capable of, leading to the feeling of going through the motions that they'd been through in countless other Zelda games. Tutorial, overworld, level, dungeon, item, overworld, level, dungeon, item, ad nauseum. And this is where its adherence to only three regions really leaves a negative impact. I know this game will continue to challenge my positive and negative feelings for many years to come. So many of its best aspects have flaws, and so many of its worst aspects tend to have redeeming qualities. It's all over the place. But I was glad I was finally able to articulate my feelings after all this time. It feels as though a weight has been lifted as I finally understand how I truly feel about this game. In truth, I'm only saying these things because I love Zelda with all my heart. I want it to be the best it can be. As I came to realize with Wind Waker, recognizing my favorite game's flaws has only made me more passionate about it. I think the ability to isolate and embrace both what I felt and what I knew was reflective of my own wisdom. Both are equally important, and we must not let one overpower the other. In working through this internal conflict over the course of a decade, I've been able to realize what I truly love about Zelda. And while Skyward Sword may not always reflect what I love, Everyone has different reasons for loving this series. That being said, we're not quite done. Skyward Sword actually manages to contextualize a lot of its decisions regarding linearity and freedom, no matter how problematic they might be, through its narrative. If there's one thing I grossly overlooked in my original playthrough, it was its story about how love and hope can bring strength, inspire courage, and instill wisdom unto those bound to a world beyond their control. Our story begins in what can only be described as a nightmare. A monster with a huge mouth and black scales rises from the earth and lets out a mighty roar. This introduction is cut short, however, as we are taken aback by the staggering beauty of a floating island above the clouds, Skyloft. We also hear Zelda's lovely singing voice for the first time. The soothing delivery of this melody contrasts not just the dark imagery of the first cutscene, but also the extravagance of Skyloft itself. Her singing seems to drown everything else out, and it becomes the focal point. Zelda becomes the focus. This will soon become a theme throughout most of Link's journey. After this, 
We cut to a sequence in which Link is being overshadowed by this monster, only for a light to shine through and inform him of his impending destiny, a journey that will soon find him. He is then startled by a wake-up call from Zelda's Loftwing and a personal letter from Zelda herself. The letter seems to be enough to get him moving. Link is spellbound by Zelda, always smiling in her presence and standing there aloof. But it also seems that Zelda has feelings for him too, seeing as she wanted Link to be the first to see her in her ceremonial garb. With that said, she also greatly wishes for Link to improve himself. Link often lives with his head in the clouds, seemingly chosen by fate to form a special bond with a rare Crimson Loftwing, lazily going about his days without practicing, and yet still passing his final knighthood exam and winning the affection of Zelda. Zelda sees potential in who Link could become if he applied himself, but Link is taking the peaceful aura of Skyloft and his infatuation with Zelda for granted. Zelda's father alludes to the potential envy his circumstances would create, and this envy is especially noticeable in Groose. At first, Groose seems to be the obnoxious bully character jealous of Zelda's feelings for Link. He is jealous to such an embarrassing extent that he was willing to lock up Link's Loftwing and prevent him from competing in the exam. And while he does idealize Zelda and obsess over her, he does make excellent points about Link's situation. Link has never had to work hard for anything he has, being a childhood friend of Zelda, and being eligible for knighthood while floating through life with his head in the clouds, as Groose puts it. Of course, I think Groose's demeanor in this scene intentionally allows for his dialogue to go in one ear and out the other for the player, nor did I deeply consider Zelda's worries either. At this point, all I knew was that Zelda liked me and I had an exam to pass. This reinforces this idea that Link has taken peace and coasting through life for granted, and if his world were to come crashing down before him, he'd be completely unprepared. After Link passes his exam, Zelda knights him and the two share a few tender and especially memorable moments together. Zelda notably pushes him off of the goddess statue so that he can complete the ceremony, symbolic of her ability to get Link moving. This is always true, even when they are apart. Just as Zelda is about to open up to Link, a giant tornado appears and whisks her below the surface. Link dives in after her, only to be knocked unconscious by the force of the tornado. He awakens in his room, having to explain what happened to Zelda's father. This would be anyone's lowest moment, as the chemistry between Link and Zelda had been portrayed perfectly. Their scenes had such warmth, and Zelda displays genuine passion and affection for Link. But with the game luring you into this false sense of security, the loss of such comfort is deeply affecting, and you have no idea where to go from here. That mysterious figure is Phi, and the mystifying flute that accompanies this sequence is her theme. She arrives at your lowest point, guiding you toward an opportunity. In that regard, I found her theme to be calming and invigorating at the same time. It has a hint of melancholy due to its subdued piano, but with Zelda being gone and nowhere else to turn, you're meant to feel compelled to press onward and follow her wherever she may take you. Phi's position in Skyward Sword as a guide character even in her most ridiculous moments, is essential. Link is about to embark on a journey that will change his life forever, and without someone to lead him through that process, he would be completely lost. With the promise of seeing Zelda alive again, Link chooses to remove the sword from its pedestal, and as gimmicky as it is, doing this with the Wii Remote will always fill me with excitement. That being said, the weight of such an adventure can prove to be a lot, Link is leaving his peaceful life behind for an adventure filled with uncertainty. Suddenly he is being thrust into his destiny without preparation. This scene spoke to me because I know exactly what it's like to be at my lowest point and for a situation like this to arise. I still vividly remember staring out the window from my hospital bed a few hours after I had received my diagnosis. I didn't know what the illness would bring, nor did I know how long I would feel that way. I suddenly had to fight but all I wanted was for everything to return to a sense of normalcy. That's why I was thankful for Skyward Sword's dialogue options. Although they merely lead to flavor text in the grand scheme of things, this self-projection was exactly what I would have needed at a time like that. 
You can choose to respond to Gaypora's words of your fated journey with dialogue options like No Way and It's So Much. Self-projection is such an important part of Zelda's DNA, and it's important to give players some choice in such an overwhelming setting. Link didn't ask to be a part of such a grand task. I didn't ask to fight off such an illness. Why should I have to fight? We fight through trial after trial, clinging to that faint promise of seeing Zelda again. Throughout most of your adventure, you can choose to respond to Fi's information dumps with a desperate Zelda? This is often comical, but she is the catalyst for your adventure after all. She is the one that keeps you going. That said, she isn't the only reason you continue to fight. This is where the Imprisoned and its constant rematches come into play. It will not stop clawing its way out of, well, imprisonment, because it serves as a reminder of what is at stake should you fail the mission. Every single time you fight the Imprisoned, it gets a little closer to reaching the Sealed Temple. It even grows arms and gains the ability to fly. Its awakening is an inevitability, as was Link's journey and the end to his time in Skyloft. In these moments, you are reminded that this adventure isn't just for the sake of seeing your precious Zelda again. It's also so that the two of you can have a world to return to when all is said and done. A balance between want and need. Of course, on my first playthrough, I was quickly distracted from the motivations of the characters by my conflicting feelings toward the game's design. I didn't take notice of the nuance of Skyward Sword's opening moments right away. However, there were other elements that informed me of what Skyward Sword was trying to convey. Love is a common theme throughout Skyward Sword, and in a world where terrible things are fated to occur, love is something that keeps us going. The lengths to which people go for their loved ones are always inspiring, and Skyward Sword portrays love in a myriad of ways through the residents of Skyloft. First, there's the siblings Pero and Oriel. Oriel abruptly disappears from Skyloft one day, worrying Pero sick about his sister. You can find Oriel stranded with her injured Loftwing on a floating island at one point in your adventure, and upon discovering this, Pero has you deliver mushroom spores to her to heal her bird. You were rewarded with an empty bottle and a few gratitude crystals for doing this. The gratitude crystals are first introduced after little Kukiel goes missing. Kukiel's innocent worldview led to her showing kindness and love to the people around her, resulting in the discovery that Petro is no demon. Her empathetic nature portrays a key element to love. Selflessness. Selflessness and sacrifice are also portrayed in Skyward Sword. Take the husband of the potion shop owner, for example. During the day, he is mixing and infusing potions for his customers while taking care of their baby. At night, you can find him taking care of the baby as it won't settle down for bed. You can choose to fetch the baby's rattle by exploring Skyloft with your claw shots, and you'll be rewarded with his tangible gratitude. The quest did get me to observe Skyloft differently, but the commitment he displays to his wife and their baby, despite the visible exhaustion he feels every day, is touching. You could argue that she is taking advantage of his kindness, but because the game never infers this, I think it's safe to assume that he is taking the helm voluntarily, and you can be the one that ends his sleepless nights. Aw, oh, that's really sweet, man. I'm gonna sleep in your bed now, next to your wife. These sacrifices can also be seen in a familial setting with Pippet and his mother. This example also serves as an actual example of someone taking advantage of another person's kindness. Pippet gives his hard-earned rupees as a knight to his mother so that she can buy food. However, she instead spends that money on housekeeping, a job that she could have done herself. This is a serious domestic issue, and the game's portrayal of this issue shows that love can be taken advantage of. The game also demonstrates a vulnerable side to finding love. Even if you put your all into telling someone how you feel, sometimes, or oftentimes, you will get rejected. Skyward Sword portrays this both comically and insightfully with Colin's letter. You can choose to deliver this letter to the girl he fancies, or you can deliver the letter to a beckoning voice from beyond the restroom. Tough choice, I know, but there's another side to this. The girl Colin is interested in has feelings for Pippet, who, upon finding this out, takes notice of his own feelings for her. If you choose to take this route, the two of them will end up together instead, although Colin was unfortunately never going to end up with his crush in the first place. After this, Colin will sulk in his room for the rest of the game. The thing is, Colin is a selfish little gremlin that only acts if a situation benefits him. He needed to work on himself and become more capable of empathy before anything could happen. And hey, the disembodied hand coming from the toilet did seem to fall for his love letter, so clearly he has a chance with someone. 
There's also the notion of love stemming from misguided feelings. Those moments in which we idealize someone and make a relationship out to be something that it isn't. Beatrice at the item check is a perfect example of this. She appears bored due to the lack of activity at the item check and dreams of meeting the perfect man. She develops feelings for you as you continue to revisit the item check, assuming that because you keep coming to see her that it must be love. You can break the bad news to her about that, but you can also play along to see where the dialogue goes. Or perhaps because you do have a crush on her? I won't judge. Even Scrapper, the robot that helps you fetch things from the surface in a painfully linear fashion, only does things because he is infatuated with Phi. These are all very complicated facets of love, and while some are demonstrated in comedic contexts, others are genuinely touching. They are all examples of how love can motivate us. But I think the one takeaway from Link's relationship with Zelda and the residents of Skyloft is the notion that love can drive us to be selfless. And there is no better example of a character learning this lesson than Groos, even in the face of his love being unrequited. First, some foreshadowing. When you first stumble into the Lumpy Pumpkin, you will see a tantalizing heart piece sitting on top of a chandelier. In order to obtain it, you need to roll into the banister a few times and cause enough momentum to bring the chandelier crashing down. As you could imagine, this greatly upsets the owner of the Lumpy Pumpkin, and he forces you to work for him in order to repay the costs. Through this journey, the staff and patrons at the Lumpy Pumpkin warm up to you, and when you're finally through with your work, the owner rewards you with an unexpected second piece of heart, proving that selflessness has its benefits. Groos learns this lesson through a particularly moving character arc. Groos, despite working hard, always comes second only to Link in his destined victories. Groos's jealousy is justified. That said, he is often fixated on his selfish desires and he romanticizes this image of him and Zelda being together that clearly isn't meant to be. Like Link, his motivations are rooted in Zelda. But when she goes missing and her and Link are caught up in a destined adventure, Groose locks himself in his room, lacking the purpose that his life once had. He remains there throughout the first three dungeons, until he abruptly reappears during a routine visit to Faron. The Groose is loose, everyone. Groose had followed Link to the surface, thinking that he could lead him to Zelda. But he is completely dumbfounded by the discovery of the surface below the clouds. I always loved that reassuring pat on the arm that Link gives him. Suddenly, he learns there's an entire world below the floating island he called home. That said, this revelation isn't enough to distract him from his fixation on Zelda, and he goes to speak with the old lady in the sealed temple. Unable to cope with the fact that Link is once again chosen by fate, and after witnessing Link seal away the imprisoned for the first time, he finds himself lost once again, feeling useless. It's a stark contrast to see his confidence and self-righteousness fall apart at the sight of your accomplishments, and that ends up being the note you leave him on for the rest of the game's second act. His problem has always been that he kept comparing himself to Link, when he should instead focus on discovering who he is, and what motivates him beyond a girl that, let's face it, was never going to go out with him in the first place. When you eventually return after so much more of your adventure unfolds, Groose's mentality seems to have changed, for the better. He even creates the Grusinator to help you deal with the imprisoned as it keeps busting out. In the end, Groose embraces his role as a supporting character and finds his own calling defending the sealed temple and protecting the old lady from the imprisoned. He even subtly resigns to the notion that his relationship with Zelda wasn't exactly meant to be. This wisdom makes him one of Skyward Sword's most memorable characters. And who knows? Perhaps with his newfound love for who he is inside, and his devotion to helping others, he'll find his own Zelda someday. With everyone in Skyloft receiving a Loftwing, it drives home this feelings that we are one half of a pair. But this creates a false reality in our minds of what is destined to happen. And the reality is, we don't know where life is going to take us. What we can control is how we react to these things. How we deal with the circumstances we've been dealt. And Groose is a prime example of that wisdom. With this talk of destiny and fate, it's important to discuss how Zelda deals with her newfound responsibility, as she has her own role to play in this journey. Our first glimpse of Zelda since the tornado comes at the end of the Earth Temple. Zelda is delighted to see Link again, but Impa informs her that she cannot go to him. As difficult as it may be, she does not let her emotions overpower her. Us? Not so much. This early in the game, I am right there with Link and wanting to run after her. Impa, however, makes sure that we feel the impact of our late arrival. 
Before Link can see Zelda again, he has a lot to learn. Fate continues to keep the two of them apart, with Girahim showing up at seemingly every turn. Girahim serves as an exact opposite to Link's personality and development. He is so keen on everything going exactly the way he plans, and when things take a turn, he loses it. His sense of entitlement and manic emotional shifts not only make him a compelling and often entertaining villain, but remind us of how such devotion and loyalty can impact one's thinking. This is a lesson that both Link and Zelda eventually learn, and that maturity is displayed through Skyward Sword's most impactful scene. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In one instance, Girahim crashes through the entrance to the Temple of Time, overpowering Impa. I love that when Link comes to her aid, you can return the favor by saying, Am I late? No matter the circumstances that keep them apart, Zelda promises Link that they'll see each other again, and that promise is enough to keep the player moving. As always. Around this time, you also receive Zelda's harp. The harp is used to play songs crucial to progression, but the fact that it is Zelda's harp reminds me of what I am fighting for. Her sailcloth that you use every time you're coming in for a landing is meant to remind you of her. Parallel to the imprisoned and the fate of the world hanging in the balance, the facts of your journey weighing on you, chasing that feeling of reuniting with Zelda is a constant through every trial you face. Your contact with Zelda all but ceases for the next three dungeons, but this allows you to restore the Master Sword to its former glory and experience more of the world beneath the clouds. You get to discover the things that people do for love in Skyloft and beyond. But while separated from Link, Zelda is unable to inform him of a critical detail regarding her role in the story, transforming what should be a delightful and well-deserved reunion into, well, something else. Finally, you've restored the Gate of Time. All that's left to do is travel into the past and reunite with Zelda. Throughout this adventure, you have thrown yourself into danger for one reason and your hard work following Destiny is finally about to pay off. Right? As Zelda appears before Link, she explains the reality of the war between the goddess Hylia and Demise, the creation of the Triforce, and how Link is the chosen hero destined to reclaim it. Zelda happens to be the goddess reborn, and as part of her solemn duty, she must remain in the past to maintain the seal on Demise, once again leaving her and Link separated. Throughout this whole explanation, it's important to note that Zelda remains calm. She never once complains or loses her composure. She realizes that this is the way things have to be, and all that she can do is play her part in ensuring a good future. Link, however, is not as strong as she is. I can say for a fact that I was devastated by how horribly unfair this situation is. I was living vicariously through Link as his childhood friend is being whisked away from him once more. Zelda's parting words will always stick with me. She was always the one to wake Link up during their time at the Academy, so she has Link promise that he would be the one to wake her up when all of this is over, solidifying their connection. Watching Zelda get sealed away after everything you fought for is hard, but such is life. Just when you think you've got the hang of things, you're suddenly thrown a curveball as you grapple with the harsh differences between the ideal and the real. Fate and free will. But as Zelda teaches us with her calm demeanor, all we can control is our actions. Zelda demonstrates true emotional wisdom, and her final words instill hope. Link hangs his head for a moment, processing the reality of this destiny he and Zelda find themselves entangled in, before collecting himself and leaving for the Gate of Time. When Link returns from the past, the same music piece that played during that cutscene in the goddess statue makes a grand return. A melody that once accompanied uncertainty now inspires you to refocus, prepare, act. And that's exactly what I intended to do. If Zelda understood the importance of her place in this war, then I can too. Even if it's hard. Even if I'll always want things to go back to the way they were. The only thing I can do is fight on. For the world's sake. For her sake. During the cutscene in which Zelda is sealed away, Zelda's lullaby plays, and throughout the rest of the game, you'll hear this song called The Ballad of the Goddess. Its lyrics allude to Link's fated adventure, but its melody actually holds a secret. The melody is simply Zelda's lullaby backwards.
This makes sense, as the lullaby is played to put Zelda to sleep. The Ballad of the Goddess is heard at the beginning of the game, when Zelda wakes Link up. In its lyrics and its melody, it constantly reminds you of what needs to be done, and why you continue to do it. It's all for the most important person in your life. That person you love. <laughs> the unbridled rage in Link's expression is all that is needed to convey how the player should be feeling. It realistically portrays the strong emotions evoked by fate's cruel twists and turns. It is a natural response, but what matters is that he channels his wisdom into the destruction of Girahim and demise. What follows is a power trip rush through hordes of enemies, and a phenomenal final boss that demonstrates Skyward Sword's combat at its finest. First you have a fight with Demon Lord Girahim in his final form. Your swords clash, you dodge slashes, and you force him to the edge of the arena, causing him to fall. You repeat this with a few stabs to the chest before reaching the ground below. I absolutely adore these next two phases because they perfectly capture the viciousness of an actual sword fight, while also building on the concepts introduced in your previous fights with Girahim. If there were ever a moment to vouch for these rematches, it would be this fight right here. You can parry blows and cut into his chest until he eventually pulls out this massive berserk-esque sword, and you need to correctly slice into the correct spots on the sword as he continuously changes his blocking stance. The rapid critical thinking and precise sword swinging that the combat has become known for culminates in this climactic battle, and I can't get enough of it. After finally beating Girahim, he still manages to use Zelda to finally resurrect Demise. And as it turns out, Girahim's new form wasn't just for show. He mirrors Phi as the spirit of Demise's sword, merely being used by him just as the goddess Hylia used the chosen hero. Fate can be a sick joke, but Demise's words challenge us to rise against it, a challenge that we are more than ready to accept. Link does the wise thing and agrees to his terms for the final battle, and what a final battle it is. It is the eternal struggle between fate and free will, distilled into a focused area. The idle movements of your sword mirror his own. His techniques are terrifying and unpredictable at first, and even when you memorize his patterns, he imbues lightning into his sword and it becomes more difficult to find openings. It seems like every time you attempt to deliver the final blow, Demise quickly avoids the attack. The end of your journey continues to slip out of reach, but you haven't given up since the beginning. You're so close to seeing this journey to the end, that you have to keep trying. This is where I realized that the motion controlled combat of Skyward Sword, and the physical exertion that it takes, was essential in enhancing the beauty of Skyward Sword's narrative. And eventually, it all comes together. The thing about Demise is destined well, demise, is that the cycle of violence is guaranteed to continue. It may take different forms, but a linear chain of events means that history will eventually repeat itself, so long as both sides are unable to get what they want. It is an unending hell for the foreseeable future. However, the very notion that this hell might return is what makes us appreciate the time we have. The carefree days in Skyloft will never be taken for granted again. With this newfound wisdom and maturity, Link no longer needs a guide. Phi has accomplished her task, and she permanently becomes one with the Master Sword for the rest of time. I like to think that her spirit lives on as each new hero comes to be, silently watching over them as they grow into who they were meant to be. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword helped me come to terms with how my emotions impact the way I think. For the longest time, I was unable to separate how I feel from what I know, and that prevented me from experiencing one of the most empowering games in the Zelda series. It acknowledges the validity of our frustrated and hopeless feelings, but it also shows us how to rationalize those feelings and that there is always an opportunity for change, even at our lowest point, if we see our faded path through to the end. Whether that means being with the one you love like those in Skyward Sword, 
or in my case, simply being healthy again and savoring the time I have. Just as Link and Zelda gained a newfound appreciation for the simplicity of their lives before the resurrection of Demise, I learned never to take my exceptional health for granted. In the end, we are both wiser from the experience. Perhaps the most ironic thing about my journey with Skyward Sword was that, in the end, it wasn't all that different from my favorite Zelda game. I was so apprehensive about Skyward Sword feeling linear, and while some of that still holds up today, the nature of its sky and the experimentation the game encourages was evocative of Wind Waker all along. Even Skyward Sword's themes of fate and free will seemed derivative of Wind Waker's lessons. Wind Waker was set against the history of the Hero of Time, and in fighting and exploring through the Great Sea, you forge your own path separate from that colossal legacy. It was also a reflection of the desires the developers had to break away from Ocarina of Time, which had been looming over them and been a base for critique of future Zelda games ever since its release. In wanting Skyward Sword to be something that it isn't, I neglected the potential for new ideas to flourish, and proved Wind Waker's point. But that's the thing about love. It can be blinding. I believe the developers of Skyward Sword gained plenty of wisdom in creating this game. The feedback they received proved to be crucial in innovating on our preconceived notions of Zelda's conventions. In future videos, we will discuss the ways in which Nintendo wiped the slate clean, tweaking or otherwise reinventing the Zelda formula, and whether or not their intentions would benefit the series. Skyward Sword is probably still my least favorite 3D Zelda, but I will always appreciate it for its commitment to its direction, and for being the catalyst for the reinvention of Zelda in all of its ups and downs. I've been Liam Triforce. Thanks for watching. Thus concludes The Legend of Groose.